Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Chad from Grayscale Gorilla, and in today's video, I'm gonna show you the first 10 things I like to do in Redshift. If you're just getting started in Redshift, this is a perfect video for you. I'm gonna talk a lot about how I set up Redshift, set up cameras, set up lights, everything. You're gonna learn something, I guarantee it. All right, let's jump into the video. Okay, number one, let's get Redshift showing up in our menu and get it going, all right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is jump over to Edit, Preferences, move this over here, go under Renderer, click on Redshift, and we're gonna start at the top and work our way down. So the first thing I wanna do is make sure that both of my GPUs are enabled here. I do wanna, if this happens to be enabled for you, make sure you disable it. This is the CPU version of Redshift. We do not wanna use that. It's still kind of in its beginnings and not really great, so we're gonna leave that off. Not gonna to touch the cache, although you might wanna raise this maximum uh, texture cache amount. In fact, I will bring it up just for the heck of it because I know I have quite a bit of, uh, I'm going to need quite a bit of this later on down the line. Hybrid rendering, do not use that. That's going to try to use the CPU and GPU, which is cool when it gets there, but it's not quite there yet. We'll leave that off. Multi-threading, leave that on. Scene grid, leave that on. Node materials for presets. This is basically going to make you choose whether or not you want to use the Expresso nodes or the new node system. I'm going to leave this on and use the new node system. Uh, let's jump down to user interface, global attribute manager for shader nodes. I'm going to turn that on. I'll show you what that does a little bit later. Redshift main menu. Yes, we want to see Redshift show up here in our main menu once we choose it as our renderer. Material previews on. I'm going to switch this to when renderer is idled, so it's not trying to draw material previews. Those are the little shader balls. We don't want that to be uh, trying to draw while we're rendering. That can kind of slow you down. Sometimes you'll even want to turn this off if you're getting performance problems. We can talk about that a little bit later. All right, so now leave it at when renderer is idled. Cool. Start automatically. Nope, I want to turn that off. I don't like the IPR starting without me telling it to start. Uh, lock render to camera. That's fine. Okay, we're all set. Let's move on to number two. Okay, so number two, let's make it fast. Let's actually set up Redshift as our renderer. I'm going to hit Control B to bring up my render settings here. We'll initialize Redshift as our renderer. And I'm going to show you the things that I do right out the gate to kind of make things go a little bit faster. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to actually dive really deep into any of the render settings. We're going to use the basic tab here, and we're going to just use our bucket quality. I'm going to set this up to low just so it goes fast. Now, I could do a deep dive on the render settings, and we could get really into it, and that's really great. If you want to learn all of that, we have an amazing course for free over on grayscalegorilla.com redshift. Sign up for free, learn all about these render settings. But for me, I'm going to use their unified sampling, which is basically going to mean I just need to choose one of these low, medium, high, very high. Or if I want to jump down into the threshold, I can do that as well. This is going to control the quality. The lower the threshold, the better the quality and the higher the render times. So right off the bat, I'll set it at low just as a good starting point. My progressive passes are going to be mainly for my IPR session. And I'm going to set that to something low as well, just to make it go a little bit faster and not have to wait as long for it to converge. Set that to 128. The next thing I usually do is make sure that GI is turned on. I kind of leave right off the bat, I'll leave the, the combined depth and trace depths at default just for the time being, but I will turn on hardware ray tracing if available. I do have GTX cards, so the good it's a good idea to turn this on if you have those types of cards, or you can leave it off, and sometimes the IPR sessions will go a little bit faster, but for final frame rendering, you might want to turn this back on. I'll turn it on for now just because we have it, and I'll, I'll make sure that it, you guys see that. And then the other thing that I want to do is go into advanced. I'm going to go over to system and I'm going to change my bucket size. This is going to be the buckets in the IPR or the render session. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this to 256. You could go up as high as 512, but 256 is going to be a good mix of speed for my cards. And we'll leave that there. Next thing I want to do is make sure that uh, Redshift is going to be taking care of ACES for me. So I'll jump over to advanced. We'll go to globals and we're going to jump down to color management i'm going to leave all of this at default for right now you could color manage and do the aces workflow using cinema 40s color management but for today we're going to leave it simple and let redshift kind of handle this for us once we've got all of our settings the way that we want we can save this out as a render preset so that we don't have to mess with it again so let's go ahead and do that i'm going to right click down here and we're going to say save preset and we'll call this redshift starter and we'll go ahead and hit OK and there we go we have it started so now let's say that we want to load that in we can just right click here say load preset redshift starter let's go ahead and activate it let's delete the other one that we had set up and there we go now we're set up every time we have our little basic setup here we've got our low it's going to be really quick to render stuff and see how it's looking 
All right, so that's kind of like my generic render settings startup. Let's go to number three. Number three, let's get comfy in Redshift. Let's make Redshift a nice, warm, comfy blanket. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to make a Redshift layout that's going to be perfect for our work. You can see I've got a bunch of saved layouts here, and we're going to make one for Redshift. All right, so if you notice, I've got Redshift in my menu up here. That's because I've got it set as my renderer. So let's jump down into Redshift and grab our render view. And you'll hear this kind of called the IPR render view. Kind of those things are interchangeable. So we're just going to drag this little hamburger thing and move it over to the right. And it'll give us a little preview line to let us know that that's somewhere that we can dock that. And what you want to do is you want to craft a layout that's going to work specifically for what you're doing. And it might take some experimentation. You may not get it off the bat. You can always edit it and revise it to make it work the way that you want. I'm going to show you my favorite Redshift layout, and we're going to give you a little quick tour. I, I really encourage you to make your own, but if you want the one that I'm using, let us know. We will gladly post it for our members, maybe on our Discord, or figure out a way to get that to you. All right, let's click on my Redshift layout, and I'll give you a quick tour. So obviously, I've got my perspective views over here to the left. I've got my IPR over here. I've got my object manager. Uh, I do have some custom scripts. If you see any things like this, these fancy little buttons here, those are things that I've made. Uh, just to help myself, we're not going to go over those too much. Our attribute panel here, our node editor, we've got the plus library here just waiting to be used. So let's just, I want to show you a couple things in here. All right, we're going to create a material. I'm going to grab a Redshift standard material. And you remember me going in here over to the preferences. And you remember me clicking on Redshift and going to a Global Attribute Manager for Shader Nodes. The reason that I click that on is because when I select a material, I want it to show up. I want the attributes to show up in my main attribute panel and not something else like attached. Like in the old Espresso editor, it had an attached attribute panel. And I just kind of got into the habit of using this over here, which is nice. And so if you're coming from the Espresso nodes and maybe you're looking to detach that node or that attribute panel, that's how you do that. I like working this way. It's just nice for me. Now that we've got our layout the way we want, we're going to come over to customization and say save layout as, and we could save this out as a layout, or we could actually save it as a startup layout. So every time we start Cinema 4D, it will automatically pop up to this layout. All right, now that we're comfortable, let's move on to number four. Okay, next up is the render view. So we've got our render view docked, and I'm going to not really get, dive too deep into all the settings here, but I'm going to talk about some you know, overall concepts and some things that I like to do. So first things first, uh, let's go ahead and hit play on this. We're just going to start our IPR session. And you're going to notice that it's really, really interactive. In fact, if we look at our render settings, this is why we chose pretty low bucket quality and low progressive passes. So when you're in this part of the IPR, this is progressive passes. That's what we're in right now. If I switch to this little guy here and hit this, and it, now we're going to be in bucket mode. So bucket mode is the mode in which Redshift will render its final frames in. And progressive mode is largely used for an IPR session. You're doing look dev, you're designing lighting and all that sort of thing. You can render out progressive as your main form of, of, of passes, but you know I, I, I'm not going to talk about that here. Another thing you can do um, right off the bat, I can see that my passes, my progressive is a little bit like it's trying, it's not under, under sampled enough. I'm going to have some, some issues with interactivity if this scene gets any, any crazier. So I'm going to go over to view and we're going to drop down to under sampling and we're change this to three. And now when I move, you can see it gets a little pixelated, but we're going to get better interactivity rather than trying to do an under sampling of one, which basically is not under sampling anything. You can also crank this way up if you have a really complicated scene like this, and then you'll get even better interactivity. But for this scene, it's pretty simple. So we can probably just knock this down to three and be fine. Okay. So we talked a little bit about bucket mode versus progressive, obviously. Uh, bucket mode is going to be for final frames, but if you want to really see what that's going to look like, you can click on the bucket mode and it'll do a bucket render for you right there. Or if you want to see your final frame output, like your actual render, you can either hit shift R and it'll render the picture view, but I actually recommend hitting this button on the far right or far left. And that's just going to render your frame to the render view. And it allows you to kind of like keep everything contained. You don't have to open up the picture viewer. This is just kind of my favorite way of rendering out a frame. Once you have a frame, you might want to share it with somebody. So one of the tips that I like to give people is you could send this to the picture viewer and like, you know, screenshot it, copy it out as JPEG, whatever. Or you can hit this button right here, which is just going to copy that image to your frame buffer. And now I can go into, let's say, Slack or Teams or something. Maybe we want to like 
you know, inform somebody of what we're doing. You can, right now, I'm just going to drop it in here. This will be easy. All right, there it is. We dropped it in there. We can paste this into Slack or Teams, something, show somebody where we're at. The last thing I like to make sure I do is make sure that I'm using the, the original size for my render. And if I'm in an IPR session, I'm in a fit window. So uh, fit window is basically like it says, it's going to fit it horizontally. If I change this to fill, it's going to try to fill up this entire space. So let's say, you know, I move my entire UI down and you can see here now we're getting some imagery. We're getting some parts of the image that won't even render like beyond the camera frustum right here down at the top and bottom. But it's going to show up over here in fill because we're using the fill mode. Let's jump back over into fit. And I'm not going to do um, to, to talk too much about these other settings in here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of these in a future uh, section. But yeah, that's kind of like a brief overview of the render view. If you want to do a deep dive, we've got tons of training, like I said, over on grayscalegorilla.com slash redshift. Entirely free redshift course. Just got to sign up with your email and get access. All right, let's move on. All right, so let's talk about cameras and the importance of cameras, scale, all that stuff. But before I jump into this part, I want to mention one thing. If you're in a new scene file and it, maybe you don't have Redshift set up as your renderer and you go to create camera, you're going to notice that there's an ST camera and some other ones down here. This is sort of like the old standard camera. Uh, it's got the physical details. So it's got these different tabs. That you might remember this from previous uh, versions. But if you're in a Redshift scene, and you go to create camera, you're gonna notice that there's different cameras in here. And I know this is confusing, but if you're in Redshift, you probably wanna use the standard camera, which is if you click this, it'll actually create an RS camera, which is a little weird because it doesn't really indicate this is an RS camera. You can also get to this from the Redshift cameras standard right here as well. So don't be confused by that. If you're in a Redshift scene, you probably wanna use um, a Redshift camera. I recommend creating the camera after you've set the renderer, just so you're grabbing a Redshift camera and maybe not the older camera. Anyway, all right, so let's just create our camera here, standard, let's look through it. The first thing I'm gonna, I always do is sort of like choose my lens, and I try to work uh, as if I'm a photographer, as if I'm, I'm a DP, and I try to work in realistic scale and choose lenses that make sense for what I'm trying to do, and if you have a background in photography, this is pretty easy. If you don't, you might want to pick up a book about photography and maybe do a little bit of studying on it because it really is important for 3D artists to really understand cameras and photography. So for this type of shot, I'm probably going to use like a longer lens. So I'm going to grab my camera, go to object and change my focal length to maybe a hundred millimeters. Then I'm just going to back off and just try to find an angle that I think looks interesting on these, maybe something like this. Uh, let's go ahead now and talk about some depth of field. So whenever I'm setting up a shot like this, I'm going to head over to the optical tab and I'm gonna think about it like, okay, if I was shooting these objects and maybe they're on a tabletop or something and they're about the size of like, you know, a box of cereal or something, which I think these are scaled similar to that. And it's important to kind of work in that real world scale. Then I sort of want to approach it that way. So if it's a dimly lit room, uh, when we get into lighting next uh, in, a, in a future chapter here, we'll talk a little bit about uh, focus and whatnot and, and the importance of aperture. Um, but for now, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to make sure that, uh, let's see, let me check all the, all my other settings here. Yep. This looks all good. Sometimes I will go into display and turn on this new focus plane, which is kind of interesting. So what this will do is if I jump back into optical and I say focus distance, I can choose a focus distance and it's going to show this kind of like uh, yellow orange color over it. And it's, it's really just the focal plane. So if I move this focal plane back and forward, it's showing you exactly what's in focus. And if you get to that, you go to display and you can turn on and off this focal plane. You can have it just only on when you have the camera selected. Uh, but for right now, we've kind of set it up, so it's fine. The other thing that I'll like to do sometimes is go down to the composition here for this camera and turn on the crosshair, which is just gonna add this nice like center crosshair and these like center marks here on the top and the bottom. Um, and then sometimes I'll turn on grid. This is kind of like, um, if I'm trying to figure out my rule of thirds or set up some composition, I'll do that. Another thing that I'll do also is actually use uh, grayscale gorillas, uh, plugin right here. I, I like to use social frame to kind of like plan out any sort of social crops that I might do. In this case, this is a center crop or maybe Instagram or something. Uh, for now, we'll leave that off that's for a future video if you want to learn more about uh, social frame go to our website okay so our camera is basically set up 
but sometimes what I like to do is create like a focal object. Um, and that sometimes can be useful um, when I'm setting up these kinds of rigs. So let's just do that really quickly here. I usually just grab a null right here and let's just change this to a triangle. That's something that I like to use. I'll make it relatively small, somewhere like in there. I'll also change under the base basic, I'm gonna change the display color to like a yellow. And then I'm going to then put it uh, onto my object here. So with that null, let me just change the name really quick. Cool. And I'm going to use this cool new feature of uh, place, which is going to essentially snap to the surface of whatever my mouse is over. So with our focal uh, null selected, I'm just going to click drag on this right here. And I think our focus might be a bit small. I made the object too small. So let's try point four. Try a little bit bigger. So I just want to be able to see it a little bit. See that focal point? All right, right there. And then with that camera selected, I'm going to go over to optical and drag that focus into the depth of field object right there. And now if we turn on our display again, we can move this focus null around, maybe up here, grab that camera. We can see that our, our focus is tracking. This can be useful if you want to lock focus to something or if you want to animate the, a rack focus of some kind. It's something that I like to do. It does get a little bit uh, distracting having that focus plane on. So I usually kind of get in the habit of like setting it and just sort of turning it off. And if I have it set up correctly, I kind of leave it off. So I don't really need to look at it anymore. All right, we'll jump into the bokeh and, and uh, aperture and all that once we turn on some lighting. But can now we have our, our basic camera kind of set up. We have a hundred mil lens. It's kind of in a good spot. We're not really gonna mess with it too much. And then what I'll usually do is, is create this as a, as a preset. So with that camera selected, uh, I'm going to come over to this little tab here uh, on the right hand side and I'm just going to say save preset and we're going to call this my RS default cam. All right. And we'll say, okay. And I like to use presets a lot because I really don't like uh, having to um, essentially do the same thing more than once. If I found myself doing something more than two or three times, I try to create a preset for it or some sort of rig or tool to help me eliminate all that all that stuff. So if we grab a new camera now, we say standard, and then we jump over here, you can see it's already set up as our default. Uh, so we've got everything the way that we want it, and we didn't have to go through all that rigmarole of trying to like make that, you know, adjust all those settings. Highly getting, recommend getting into the habit of saving presets and creating defaults for yourself. All right, so our camera is kind of set, and I think we're ready to move on. Hey, I also forgot to mention that we have a bunch of great videos on bokeh and depth of field and all that stuff over on our YouTube channel, so I highly recommend checking it out. We'll add some links below, uh, but yeah, feel free to grab those. Okay, number six, let there be light. All right, so this is kind of, we've set up our camera, we've set up our scene, kind of getting into it now. We're going to add some lights, right? So that's important. So I'm going to start my IPR. And the first thing that I usually do is I try to see how far I can get with uh, an HDRI and a dome light. So under lights, dome light, right? I'm going to, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. I am going to use HDRI link. If you don't know what HDRI link is, it's a fantastic way of previewing and auditioning a bunch of different HDRIs quickly. In Redshift, highly recommend checking it out. It's on our website. Uh, all right, with the dome light selected, I'm going to grab my HDRI, HDRI link tag. I'm going to jump over to texture, drag that onto the tag, which is immediately going to hook it up to my HDRI libraries. So let's jump down into the plus library. We'll let that load. And we're going to just kind of light the scene up with, a, with an HDRI. And then we're going to add a few maybe quads to kind of kick out some specific areas. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about that depth of field that I was going to talk about. We'll add a background as well. All right, so let's go to HDRIs with the HDRI link tag selected. I think I want to do something from our modern industrial collection, maybe something pretty basic like modern industrial 10. I am gonna select the tag and make sure I jump over to advanced and say preview. This will load like a slightly less, le low resolution, faster version of that HDRI. Uh, I am gonna jump into the dome light and bring the saturation down to maybe like 20%. So I'm desaturating that HDRI a little bit. Then I'm gonna rotate this a little bit, maybe over in, I want that light to kind of come from there and let's bring the intensity up another thing i forgot to mention when you're working is this ability to go into the ipr into the render view and work in this uh, clay mode so if i change this 
uh, little view mode here to clay. This is allow, it's kind of puts like a generic gray material over everything. And it's a kind of a good way to like take a look at your lighting and adjust your key to fill ratio. Maybe we want to like blow this light out a little bit. And maybe we went a little too far on that. All right, cool. So something like in here, and again, we're just kind of like setting it up sort of generically. Once we start to add materials, we might want to change it a little bit. But for right now, I think this is feeling pretty good. All right, maybe we want to try something a little bit different. Let me try number 10 instead. Something a little bit more top lit. And then I'm just going to rotate this, try to make it a little bit more dramatic. Somewhere like in here. It's feeling pretty right. Okay, maybe bring that intensity down just a little bit like in here. Something like that. All right, now I'm going to add like a quad light to kind of give me a little bit more directional light coming on to this scene. But before I do that, let's go ahead and turn off the environment. And we're going to add another dome light to be our background. So let's grab redshift, lights, another dome light. And we're going to rename this one BG for background. Let's make sure that it's showing up in the background. But we are going to jump over to details and turn off its contribution in all these different ways. Let's just pull this down here. And now we'll set up a color. I'm going to actually pick something fairly neutral. Uh, I do have one set up here already. Something kind of like this is kind of cool. All right, next thing, let's, uh, let's add our, our quad light. Go to lights. We're going to grab an area light. And I sometimes use the word quad. That's because other renderers will, might call it a quad. So if you hear me say quad, I really just mean area light. Uh, let's jump here and just figure out, uh, I'm going to show you like a really quick and dirty way to build a, a really simple light rig. I'm going to pull this light off, um, and I'm just going to scale it, uh, down a little bit. Actually, I won't touch the scale yet. We're going to add two nulls. So I'm going to add this first null at the center of the scene. And then I'm going to add a, another null. And this null is going to be our light. And this is going to be our light controller and let's go ahead and toss this light underneath our area light and we're going to zero out its transforms so that it sits right at the origin of that light and we're going to break it off and we're going to make that light a child of that null and then we're going to make that null a child of the controller the reason that i'm doing that is so that i can grab this controller and i can rotate this light around my scene and I can also grab this controller and I can rotate it this way. Um, so it kind of gives me a little bit more control over, our, over my lighting. So I know I kind of want something uh, a little bit smaller in terms of our light. So maybe I'll do like a 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. Something that's going to have a little bit more of a directional shadow. And now I'm going to turn off my dome light so that I can really see what I'm doing here. And I'm going to rotate this over here. Maybe I want to like raise it up over my scene a little bit, something like this, a little bit more on that side. And then I'm going to bring the intensity down. Uh, and if I want to get a little bit of a sharper shadow, I might adjust the spread, which is kind of like pointing, it's like barn doors on your light. They're going to close and make the light a little bit more focused. I might do something like this, which immediately makes the exposure a little too bright. I'm just kind of bringing some directional light back into this. I'll turn on my dome light again. And now we can kind of experiment with our lighting. And maybe we want something a bit more dramatic, so we'll bring that dome light intensity down a little bit more. Get a little bit more drama. And let's go ahead and move this and just see what it's doing. Kind of like it a little bit of a stretched shadow on this piece here. Okay, so really quick, let's just talk a little bit about depth of field. I'm going to grab my camera, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. So if, I, if this is sort of like a dim, uh, dimly lit scene, maybe it's a studio scene, so it's not like the lights aren't crazy bright, uh, I would expect to be at an aperture of maybe around, I don't know, like 5.6. So if I change this to 5.6 and I turn on bokeh, you're going to notice that it comes out of, it gets out of focus a little bit right here in the back. I'm not sure if that's coming through. And if we move our camera closer, it's going to naturally kind of also uh, react accordingly because we have our focus set up from the previous chapter, right? So maybe we want to be like somewhere like in here, maybe a little bit closer, like right there. So 
So if we think that, you know, maybe we would actually shoot this with a slightly different f-stop, maybe it would be closer to like a 4 or a 2.8, then you can see that our bokeh becomes a little bit more pronounced and our depth of field is a little bit more shallow. So this can kind of really, uh, you kind of have to start thinking like a photographer and understand like, okay, how, if I was shooting this for real, what f-stop would I be at? What kind of lens would I be using? And all these choices are going to inform your decisions and give you a more photographic, realistic look. Okay, so that's kind of like our shot. We're kind of digging that. I'm not really going to mess with the, um, with the lighting too much right now until we start getting some materials on it. But we've set up our focus object. We've got our light rig kind of set up the way that we want. Uh, we might add some textures to this. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think we'll need it right now. Got our background set. We've got our dome light. Now we're ready to move on and start actually adding some cool materials to this. So let's jump into that. Okay, so before we jump into texturing, I did want to talk a little bit about organization. I know this isn't like the, the sexiest topic, but hey, we all have to keep our scenes organized for our future selves and people that we work with. So you may have noticed I have a bunch of these crazy folders over here. I've done some videos and some. Uh, I think we've made a few posts about, about these. These are nothing more than nulls, and they're using uh, Cinema 4D's icon. So if we go to the uh, one of these nulls and we go on icon and we say load preset, you have these pre these icons that they ship with, and then we're just using these folder icons down here, and, and then we're just setting the display color to layer because we're going to adjust that using layers. And if you haven't played with layer the layer system in Cinema, I highly recommend it. It's a great way to like stay organized and keep things kind of like working properly, and just so that when you open it up uh, a year from now, whatever that scene, you're going to know where things are and how things work. So I start every scene off with these nulls here, these folder nulls. And then once I start working and I start piling stuff on top, I just take a minute to sort of like drag things down to where they belong. So I'll put the cameras where they belong. I'll put the focus in there. I'll put my lights all into the light, uh, under the light null here. Cool. Now I'm going to add these to my layers. There's a couple different ways that you can do that. You can just like drag and paint your layer selection on that, which is going to assign these objects down to this cams layer. Or you can grab all these and hold down control and hit and drag it onto the lights like this. And it's going to assign it to everything that's under that hierarchy. So now that everything's kind of cleaned up and ready, I'm going to move on to some textures. Okay, so I have some basic materials kind of set up here. I'm using uh, Grayscale Gorilla Plus, some tactile wood materials, and a few plastic materials. And our lighting is looking good. Um, I am using the Espresso node graph and I wanted to show you this really quickly here. Uh, I kind of got into the habit of just like turning this stuff off. Um, of course, if you need it to search for things, I highly recommend you leave it on, but uh, I've kind of just gotten into the habit of turning it off. And of course, because we have our attribute panel set to show our stuff, it's all showing over here the way I showed it earlier in the uh, preferences. Our lighting looks good. Um, I think I'm going to add a fill to the bottom a little bit. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm just going to duplicate. I'm holding down control and dragging to make a copy of that light. Uh, I'm going to make this area like quite a bit bigger. So I'm going to make it like 120 by like 120. And I'm also going to take that spread and uh, turn it all the way up so it's fully spreading that light. And now we're just going to essentially bring it down right below uh, our objects here. And I'm just going to try to find an angle to give a little fill to that bottom area. And I'm not really going to, it's not going to be too bright. I'm just bringing it just a little bit in there like that. And let's turn, take a look without it. And what it's going to do is it's going to provide just a little bit of something happening in that, in these shadow areas over here. I might even like make it a little bit larger so that it creeps a little bit further down into there. Let me actually see exactly how far away this is. Also, I'm going to just clean up my scene and hide, uh, or actually I'm just going to delete this extra camera that we have sitting out there. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. So the next thing I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the object tag, the redshift object tag. Uh, and I'm going to put that on top of this null here. Um, let's get rid of that extra material there. So I'm going to go to tags and we're going to go down to render and grab an RS object tag and add that to our null. Okay, so this tag, um, there's a lot going on with this tag. And if you want to do a deeper dive on what 
this tag is capable of doing. Again, check out our free Redshift course. We've got tons of training over there for our purpose because we do have some woods on here and these woods have displacement on them. I have one of the materials selected right here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to want to turn on some, some tessellation and some displacement. So if we just do this like by default and we turn this on, we turn on tessellation and then we turn on displacement, we're going to notice uh, that everything's going to get pretty weird looking. So if we just let this sit there and tessellate all these objects, that's not at all what we want because the default scale is just way, way, way too big. And if you want a deeper dive on displacement, we have a whole bunch of videos on displacement in Redshift. Okay, so typically when I'm doing stuff with displacement, I'll work in clay mode just so I can get an idea of what the geometry displacement is actually doing and how many tessellation, uh, you know, the factor of tessellation that we need. Typically, um, I'll kind of do a non-screen space version and just bring this to zero, which basically is going to force the geometry to be tessellated three times, or subdivided three times, rather. And I just kind of like see what's going to be enough to sell this effect. And again, the displacement scale is way, 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 way too high right now. I do think a subdivision of three is probably going to be totally fine. Um, but again, it's like we're going to wait and see. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty fine. In fact, I think we could get away with like two as our maximum subdivision there. And I think that'll be fine. And then we're going to turn our scale way, way down. So we'll turn our scale down to like 0.02, something like that. Because this wood doesn't really have a whole lot of stuff like, you know, sticking out. Maybe 0.05 might be better. And we'll take a look once we turn off the uh, clay mode. That's looking pretty good. Let's go ahead and enable our textures. Even that's too heavy. Like it, it feels really way too, too strong. So let's bring this back down to 0 0.02, somewhere like in there. And at that point, I think we could probably reduce our subdivisions as well. Maybe we can just get away with one and that'll speed things up. I might sometimes switch this to a screen space adaptive, uh, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, but for now, we'll just keep, keep it simple and just have it like, you know, overall subdivide. Another thing you can do to speed things up, like I was mentioning before, is jumping into the uh, advanced settings here, or sorry, the basic settings, turning off this hardware ray tracing if available can sometimes speed this, this optics part of it up. You notice if I change something here, if I make this like four, you're gonna see it's preparing the ray tracing hierarchy for meshes, and then it's going to go through, and once it does that, you'll see little optics, uh, here we go, executing tessellation, needed for optics, RT. So sometimes I've noticed that turning off this hardware ray tracing can, yeah, there we go, opt, initializing optics, R, R, optics RT. Turning this off can sometimes make your uh, IPR go a little bit faster. Not all the time, but you know sometimes that can be a help. Uh, and when that happens, uh, just remember to turn it back on if you wanna utilize this when you're doing your final frame. All right, we'll let this go. We'll leave it off for now, that's fine. All right, so let's test light this back down to where we had it. I think it was two, and that should probably do it. Let that come back, there we go. You can see it kind of went a little bit faster, didn't have to calculate that optics RT. All right, so we got our bottom looking, our, you know, our fill looking pretty good. I feel like it's on, on the right track. I might do one thing, one other trick that I like to do sometimes is just put a little bit more GI into our dome light, which is doing all the heavy lifting for our lighting here. So I might change this, I'll go into the details tab and under global illumination, I might change this to like 1.5, basically adding like 50% more strength to the GI. It just might help push some light back into these like little crevices, which can kind of look interesting. Okay, so another thing that I might do is uh, while I'm looking at this, is sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I'll actually change my filter settings in Redshift, just to get, if I'm going for like a really sharp, overly sharpened kind of look, I'll jump into the advanced tab and under the filter, I'll change this to Lancos and I'll bring this filter size up to like six. And with that there, and maybe we want to now increase our uh, quality and our, on our bucket quality. And let's go ahead and just render out this frame. Uh, <clears throat> I should probably in increase the size, but this is fine. So we'll just wait and see what this does. Okay, so it's finished. I think I'm gonna actually increase the output size just to make this a little bit easier to see. 
And I'm also going to go back into basic uh, redshift and we'll just change our bucket quality threshold to like 0 0.03, which will give us a little bit faster render time. So again, just tweaking that filter method just gives you that little bit of that crunchier, oversharp kind of vibe, which is kind of cool. Um, let's go ahead and change this to fit so we can see that whole render there. Um, you know, it's up to you whether you want to utilize that. Also, the the threshold and bucket quality, I kind of gotten away from like doing a deep dive and like going crazy with all the settings and trying to optimize, optimize. I kind of just rely on this threshold to get me what I, what I need. All right, so that's looking pretty good. I think our overall strength of the displacement is still a bit too high, so I'm going to bring that back down to like 0.01. And let's go ahead and kick off the IPR and take a look at that. That's looking pretty good. Cool, so now we've got our lighting. We've got our materials all set up here. We're in a pretty good place. Let's move on to a few little tweaks and hacks that I like to do to make the image just make, make it look even a little bit better. All right, so in this section, we're gonna talk a little bit about making it look even a little bit cooler using some LUTs and some post effects in Redshift here. So post effects can be accessed either through the camera or through this little gear icon here attached to your IPR. And you see there's a bunch of stuff in here. There's, um, you know, bloom and flares and all kinds of stuff in here. And of course, you can also control this right in the camera. The reason I kind of like don't like to do it in the camera is because if you have multiple cameras set up, you might forget to change something in there and it won't be global across your scene the way that it would be if you're doing it via the settings. So here's a couple of hacks that I like to do. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit easier to see. And we'll change this to fill just so that this is gonna be a little bit cooler to look at than just a tiny little square. And let's just move this over here. Okay, let's move that over there. Move this down here so we can see this a little bit a little bit better. Okay, um, so the first thing I like to do is sort of like kind of, this is a hacky thing, but I just kind of like it. I just like the way it looks, and I kind of start projects like this, is I'll go ahead and turn on the LUTs. And there's a LUT that I use for almost everything, and it's going to be the Advantix 200. And this comes default in Redshift. You just have to turn on LUT, select the Advantix. But make sure you're applying the color management before the LUT so the ACES transform is happening before the LUT is applied. And of course you can mix it down and mix it back up. And what I like about this LUT is it just adds just a little bit more of an S-curve to it and it also warms up the image just ever so slightly. And that's kind of like my starting point. And then of course I go from there and I'm like, well, do I need to introduce any sort of like curves, additional curves to this? Do I need to add bloom? In this case, bloom doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, I might tweak some, you know, uh, you know, tone mapping. It does have tone mapping built in, but I kind of really don't touch that that much. I might add some some vignetting occasionally, but I tend to keep it pretty simple in here. If we did turn on bloom, if we wanted to make it look like there's maybe some atmosphere in the space, that's kind of a hacky way to do it, but it kind of can sometimes work to your advantage. So if we bring this bloom threshold way, way down, and you can kind of see it kind of blows out the light on our wood over here. But then you can just kind of take the softness up a little bit and then take the overall intensity way, 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 way down to something like this. And now if we go ahead and just let this converge for a second and maybe we'll send it to our picture viewer or in our case, we'll use our snapshots. So let's go ahead and snapshot that and then we'll turn it off and we'll let it converge for a second and then we'll snapshot that. That's pretty good right there and we'll hit snapshot. Now let's kind of A-B between the two. We've got the no bloom and the bloom. And I don't know, it kind of adds a little something, kind of a little bit right in here. You can see a little bit of atmospherical kind of like quality to it. And of course, you know, I don't know, it's up to you. Like you can kind of A-B it and see if it's something that you want to add. I'm going to leave it off for me right now just because I don't think we really need it. It's kind of distracting, but it's there. You know, all this stuff is kind of fun to play with. But typically I come in here, I set up my LUT and I just kind of set it and forget it. And then if I need to add any of that stuff, I might do it in post or I'll just do it right here if I need to add any sort of contrast or anything like that. Uh, okay, so the other thing um, that I wanted to talk about is this idea of, um, of getting your stuff basically to render and not have to constantly name your outputs. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is tokens. Hey, real quick bonus tip. If you're working in your display mode of garode shading, uh, is it garode? Garode? 
Hit me in the comments if you know. Um, and your lights look all blown out like this. There's an easy fix for that. So all you have to do is jump over to your lights, select them. In our case, we have this light and we have this light. And we're going to go over to basic, or sorry, uh, where is it at? Preview under object. And we're just going to adjust the preview intensity, illumination adjustment, to like maybe 0.2. Maybe, maybe a little bit higher, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. And maybe we want this bottom one that's uh, just kind of maybe not quite as uh, bright. This one might be like 0 0.5, somewhere there. Of course, if you don't want, you don't care about seeing the lighting in that viewport, you can always just switch this over to quick shading. That's always easy too. Anyway, thought I'd give you that little quick tip. All right, so we're almost ready to output this render, but let's talk about tokens. Tokens is probably the one of the last things that I do before I'm ready to kick something off. Let's open up our render settings and talk about some tokens. So tokens are basically a way to pull information from your scene and into the name or output of your render. They're super handy and very powerful, and you can access them by going into the save file, and there's a little drop down right here. Now we're going to keep the scene pretty simple. We're going to do 8-bit PNGs. Our aces will be baked into it. Maybe we're just going to send this out to the web or wherever. We don't need to comp it. If you're going to be doing any kind of comping, you're going to want to render out half floaty XRs, and I've got videos on that and talk about that in the past. But for now, we're going to keep it simple. So let's like look at this little flyout menu here with all of our tokens. Now, if you look at your version of Cinema 4D, you may not have as many tokens as I have. That's because all these ones with the little uh, brackets that say CV. These are Cineversity tokens. Uh, they have a great set of tokens that add additional kind of functionality to tokens. I highly recommend checking it out. And we're going to use, uh, well, actually, we'll, we'll try not to use any of them. We'll try to use the same ones that you have in the default tokens. But you can see there's stuff in here that's crazy. You can, like, pull the current computer name, the camera, the current frame, the pass that you're on, take, date, time, all this stuff. You can get really crazy with it. In fact, I think I have some videos where I talk about never having to name an output again, where you can use the time and all this sort of thing to make it so that you can just literally hit render and you never have to worry about naming your output. We're not going to do that today. We're going to keep it kind of simple. So I've got my output directory set, and I've got my, my initials here as a folder. I'm going to add another slash to make that a folder. And we just want to create a folder for the project name. So I'm going to come down here and say project name. It's just going to be dollar sign $PRJ. It's going to pull the project name. And we want to put that into a folder, I'll add another slash, and then we want our output, our actual image, to be called project name underscore camera, current camera. So we're going to grab the current, where's it at? Current camera, boom, which is, is dollar sign camera. Now we could put more information in this, but this is totally fine. This is where I would come in, and maybe if I haven't renamed my camera, I might do that. So we'd call this like close cam or whatever makes sense to you. All right, so now our, our output's going to be named the name of our project and underscore camera. Now we, our output, we're just doing one frame at 2K. That's totally fine. Everything looks good here. So we've got that all set up. Our tokens are ready. Let's go ahead and render this out. Okay, so number 10, flight check. So we're ready to render this out, but before I do that, I always like to do a little bit of a flight check. I like to make sure that I don't have any missing textures if I'm going to be sending this off to the render queue or team render. So I'm going to go over to the Redshift menu here, and we're going to say Asset Manager. And we're just going to make sure that everything is where it needs to be. And this will take a second to open based on how many materials I have. And we're just basically looking for any sort of red errors here. And I don't see anything. That's looking pretty good. The other thing that I'll sometimes do is collect all of those assets into my project directory so that when I open it up later, I don't have to worry about, you know, did I move my material somewhere? Is it not hooking up properly? And the way I'm going to do that is jump into Window, and we're going to go to, where is it at? Uh, project Asset Inspector. Uh, so with all of this in here, what we want to do is just grab everything and hit this little orange arrow that's pointing up. And if I mouse over it, you can say it says consolidate assets. If I click this, it's going to ask me, where do you want to keep these things? So let's go ahead and jump into the project directory of where my scene file is located. And I'm going to hit select folder. And it's going to copy all of these assets over locally next to into a TEX folder next to that scene file. So the reason that you might want to do this is let's say you're sending it to, you know, team render or 
You just want to make sure in the future that you have everything you need and you don't have to worry about maybe hooking up materials that may be missing or something like that. So that's going to take a second to do that. We'll let that finish up and it looks like it's finished. You can see it put it into a TEX folder right there. It's going to be you have no problems rendering this out. Everything has been found. We got green checks all up and down the board. So let's go ahead and render out this frame. I think we're I think we're about done. So uh, anyway, thanks for watching and uh, let's let that render while we're signing off here so you can see it. All right, so all our textures are consolidated. We've kicked off our render and we are wrapped up. If you want to learn more about Redshift and dive deep into any of the things that I covered here today, I highly recommend checking out grayscalegorilla.com slash Redshift. We have a huge Redshift course, absolutely free to sign up. Just go in there, sign up with your email, get access, and start learning Redshift. All right, guys, thanks again. See you later.